Hello folks, hope you're okay today. We're looking at the historical reliability of the Gospels. Finding it uh, a blessing, so let's come before the Lord. Lord, uh, we thank you for this day, and Father, we ask for your forgiveness, and uh, Father, we ask for your cleansing, and for your grace and your mercy. And Father, uh, we pray that you forgive us today and that you bless us as we look at your word and as we think about the Gospels, Lord, in your name and for your glory. Amen. Okay. Um, we're going to look at um, internal evidence for seeing whether the Gospels are history or not. Like I said, I burn no originality within this work, research. Um, what I'm saying is based principally on Dr. Timothy McGrew's lecture that I have taken uh, from his lectures and then interspersed it with my own thoughts and my own thinking. Um, if we turn to Luke chapter 1 verse 4, uh, we read these words that thou mightst know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Um, and so the Gospels were written um, so that we can know the historical truth about Jesus. So we're going to look at the internal evidence of the Gospels to show whether they indicate there is any historical veracity to what they say. Now, as we think about this, as we look at the nature of this literature, if this uh, produces or provides uh, information that unwitting information that shows that these sources are based in history, then that's a good indication of what um, of whether these books are historical. Now, there will be a generally a charge, there is generally a, a kind of misunderstanding here by skeptics and even a lot of Christians and basically because there are these four Gospels, there is generally the idea that that there was just one Gospel, i.e. Mark, and the rest of the Gospels copied from Mark. This is a complete misunderstanding of the four Gospels. It doesn't really understand the nature of the Gospels when these kind of ideas and comments are taken on board by Christians and by skeptics. What we need to do is, if we analyze the Gospel text, we will see an interconnectedness of sources that show that the Gospels are not just been copied from one, but actually they use their own sources as well. If you look at literature um, that is uh, fictional, they will not have this interlockedness, interlockedness kind of methodology um, to prove that they are historically correct. Um, we have the four, four Mark, Luke, and John. Let's just look at the interconnectedness of these gospels now. We look at Matthew chapter 14, verse 1 and 2. It says, At that time Herod Tertarach heard of the fame of Jesus and said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works to do show forth themselves in him. So, the question is, how would the writer Matthew know what Herod was saying? You get in Luke chapter 8, verse 3, the reason why. And Joanna, the wife of Shusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others which ministered unto him of their substance. 
So Luke explains to us the Matthew passage and gives us a better context. So there we see a connection in Matthew. Now, this culminative idea of historical verification is very powerful because on the face of it, these historic these bits of historical information are unwittingly given by the writers. They are not designed. And they're subtle indicators that the Gospels are actually based in history. If we get numerous of these or a lot of these um, minutiae historical bits of information then we have to take it in, into consideration that this is a very important historical document. We, we see this very verse 14 and 16 in quotes when Jesus entered Peter's house he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever he touched her hand and the fever left her and she rose and began to serve him that evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons and he cast out the spirits with a sword and healed all who were sick now you get the context explained in Mark chapter 121 29 and 32 and they went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching and immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever and immediately they told him about her and he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up and the fever left her and she began to serve them that evening at sundown so in Mark chapter 1 verse 21 29 32 what we see is those who wanted to see Jesus uh, kept there until sundown. Why is it? Because you had the Jewish, it, it would have violated, sorry, um, they didn't want to violate the Sabbath, the prohibition of work. So what we see here is Matthew is explained again by the Gospel of Mark. So we've got Luke showing us information that is needed to understand Matthew. We have Mark giving us information helping us to understand Matthew. Let us look at the transfiguration. Uh, Luke chapter 9 verse 28, 35. Jesus' face is altered and his Moses and Elijah appear in glory and speak with him of his departure. A cloud covers them and a voice comes out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. In Luke chapter 9 verse 36 he says, And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. So we need to think about what that means in Luke chapter 9 36. In Mark chapter 9 verse 9 we read and as they were coming down the mountain he charged them not to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Mark chapter 9 verse 9 gives us the, the statement and does not but says uh, sorry Mark gives us the statement but shows doesn't indicate whether they obeyed it but omits the command so we see an interlocation of the textual information so we're seeing Mark so let's get this we're seeing Mark verifies Matthew Luke verifies Matthew but now Mark verifies Luke okay In John chapter 6 verse 5 we read these words, Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? 
in Luke chapter 9, verse 10 and 11, and he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethesda, where the crowds learned, and they followed him. In John chapter 12, he came to Philip, who was from Bethesda in Galilee. So the reason, so without the John text, without that context, you would not understand the other passages in the other Gospels of why the Lord asked Philip, because for, for where should we buy bread? Because Philip was near the area uh, where they were situated. So we see Luke didn't mention Philip in the context. John didn't mention Bethesda as the setting of the miracle. But you put them together and you get a good understanding of the text. So there we see uh, Luke verify Matthew, Mark verify Matthew, Mark verify Luke, Luke now verifying John. Do you see how it's all interconnected? So let's see. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? So the question is, why would Jesus ask Peter? Mark chapter 14, 29, Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. Mark records the boast of Peter. John does not. So, we're seeing this. Luke verifies Matthew. Mark verifies Matthew. Mark verifies Luke. Luke verifies John. Yeah? And it's all, and then Mark verifies John. Mark chapter 6, verse 31, 39. As he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. He had no leisure even to eat. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. Mark 6, 31, 39 about the green grass. If you look at a picture of that area you will see that it's only a, at a particular time of the year where the grass appears green. So in John chapter 6 verse 4 it says now the Passover the feast of the Jews was at hand. Now the Passover was at a time a, se a season sorry was it sorry the Passover is the growing season in, the, in, in Palestine. John then gives us the crucial information that connects Mark's understanding of the situation. So we have, here we go, Luke verifying Matthew, Mark verifying Matthew, Mark verifying Luke, Luke verifying John, Mark verifying John, John verifying Mark. It's all interconnected. In Luke chapter 23, uh, 2 and 4, we read, And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbid forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ the king. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. Luke 23, 2 and 4, Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. This situation doesn't make sense in Luke 23, 1, 4. We've got the Jews making accusations. Uh, Pilate doing the questioning. The Lord um, admitting the the charge and uh, Pilate says he's innocent but then you read in John 18 38 so Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him are you the king of the Jews Jesus answered my kingdom is not of this world Pilate went back outside to the Jews and told them I find no guilt in him So we see that John's account of Pilate, we see, comes from nowhere. We see that Luke shows the accusation, but not 
all what's said. John gives us all the answer, but not the accusation. So we read this. We, we've got Luke points to Matthew. Mark points to Luke. Luke points to John. John points to Luke. Luke points to John. Mark points to John. And John points to Mark. It's all interconnected. So we see all these unwitting historical pieces of information that the writers have written which can uh, beautifully um, expand and complement each other. Uh, too detailed, too intricate for anyone to have made it up to try and get all this interconnectedness and historical verification. It's quite remarkable. So we'll finish there. I hope that was uh, a blessing to you. Uh, if you want to listen to the full lecture in detail, uh, go to uh, uh, type in um, the historical reliability of the Gospels um, and uh, if you type in um, Dr. Timothy McGrew you'll be able to get his lecture notes and you'll also be able to listen to his lectures and I've just quoted you the biblical texts uh, from one of his lectures um, and so I hope that has been a blessing to you and a help. And uh, so basically there's a lot of historical material in the Gospels, there's a lot of interconnectedness going on and it's not just based on one Gospel and then the others are copied, it's much more complicated, nuanced and richer than skeptics and even Christians uh, really appreciate and I hope this has strengthened your faith. Let's close in prayer and um, and our book recommendations. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love and grace, and we give you the prayers and the glory. And Father, I pray uh, that you would bless these talks, and I pray that as I share these thoughts that you would bless them. And I pray people would uh, go to study the more detailed notes and thinking of, of uh, Dr. McGrew. And uh, so, Lord, I pray that this would be a blessing to people, a help to people, and an encouragement to them and that uh, father skeptics would be open to the truth and so Lord we pray for your blessings and help in Jesus name Amen okay we're going on to the next one and I hope this has been a blessing to you